device innovation, new material combinations, and growing human organs. What else could you want? Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. This year, electronic engineering podcast brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. Folks, we have an absolutely fun podcast to throw your way this week. My guest is Casper Van Austin, business field head and managing director at Intermolecular Incorporated, a subsidiary of Merck KGAA, Darmstadt, Germany. Casper and I are talking all about synthesizing new materials for device innovation, how Intermolecular is tackling some giant challenges in the world of electronics, life sciences, and healthcare with their new innovation hub, and how control at the atomic limit inspired Casper to get into the world of semiconductors. But before that, let's grow some organs in this week's news you may have missed. Okay, maybe I'm going a bit fast here. Organs grown in the lab aren't exactly ready for prime time just yet. But with a new bio-ink developed at Lund University in Sweden, it seems that we're a whole lot closer than ever before. So get this, for the first time, human-sized airways have been 3D bioprinted with the help of patient cells. And the key here is that new bio-ink, which is a unique combination of a material derived from seaweed, alginate, and extracellular matrix derived from lung tissue. And the 3D printed constructs that use this special bio-ink are not only biocompatible, but also can support new blood vessel growth into the transplanted material. So, how is this done? Well, it's certainly not immediate just yet. You know, turn on the 3D bioprinter and bam, there's a lung. No, (laughs) there are several stages of development of the tissue. And right now, this special bioink can be used to 3D bioprint two types of cells found in human airways, which can then be used to 3D bioprint those small human-sized airways I mentioned earlier. So how they tested this new system is also quite interesting. They used a mouse model that resembled the immunosuppression used in patients that are undergoing an organ transplant. What they found was that these 3D printed constructs using this new kind of bio ink supported new blood vessels and most importantly were well tolerated. Darcy Wagner, an associate professor working on this project, puts this bio ink in perspective like this. She says, These next-generation bio-inks also support the maturation of the airway stem cells into multiple cell types found in human airways, which means that less cell types need to be printed, simplifying the nozzle numbers needed to print tissue made of multiple cell types. So we're already there, right? Well, not so fast. Darcy Wagner does point out that in order to 3D bioprint further parts of the lung, including distal lung tissue and air sacs, the resolution needs to be improved. So once we lock in these resolution issues, 3D bioprinting the entire lung may indeed be a reality. Martina DeSantis, the first author of this study, sums up the future of this kind of technology like this. The development of this new bio-ink is a significant step forward, but it is important to further validate the functionality of the small airways over time and to explore the feasibility of this approach in large animal models. Wow. So if you want even more information about this super cool bio-ink study, I've included a link below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com. 
All right, it's time to bring in Casper from Intermolecular and talk all about how Intermolecular is engineering the next generation of devices with the help of some exciting material combinations. Let's go. Hi, Casper. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. Great to be on your show. Thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. Now, first off, Casper, for my audience who may not know, what is Intermolecular all about? So at Intermolecular, we find material solutions for our customers in the semiconductor sphere. And we do that in a fully dedicated setup. So that means that we do that work for the customer and they fully own that. And what we talk about material solutions, that is about combinations of materials. So not just a, a single layer or a single material, but you know, everyone working in the semiconductor space knows that the exciting bits are really happening at the interfaces of materials. And so we work for our customers really building those combinations of materials to get that device innovation that they're looking for. And so we have specialized tools to, to do that in a very rapid and fast way and collect all those different combinations and map out all the possibilities for our customers so that they know they have the, the best combination for their solution. So we take materials that any material we can get our hands on, basically, and try to, in a clever way, combine them and engineer that next generation of device. And since one and a half years, we are part of Merck KGA Darmstadt, Germany. So that's where we have also material colleagues and chemists who can, if we don't have a material on the shelf or from anywhere, uh, also from any other parties, they can actually work with us to synthesize new materials. And we do that here in, in Silicon Valley in San Jose in a large clean room where we have these processes set up and, and serve our customers. That's very cool. Now, Casper, I read that you guys are just expanding your Silicon Valley Innovation Hub. So what was the goal in creating this Innovation Hub in the beginning? Yes, I'm really excited about this new change. So the Innovation Hub team is a team that looks beyond today's business to establish connections with businesses of the future. So this is a team also part of Merck KGA Darmstadt, Germany, and they really take the big challenges that fall within the realm of our business sectors that Merck KGA has. So that is electronics, but that's also life sciences, and that's also healthcare. And they try to establish connections with innovative companies, could be startups, could be other companies, and, and start working with them with the idea that for these, you know, the best way that we as uh, can contribute to these big challenges is by doing what we do best. So these are really far out challenges, but we build from the basis of, of what we can do today to support these innovative companies in achieving their goals. And one example that they are very active in today, for example, is clean meat. So this has nothing to do with electronics yet. Um, so clean meat is tackling the problem that our meat consumption in the world is depleting a lot of natural resources and it's really a problem. And so the idea behind clean meat is that if you grow real meat in the laboratory uh, to make your, your steak or uh, whatever you want to eat without first having to grow a whole animal and then uh, you know, slaughter it, that is a much more efficient way uh, of doing things. So that's one big challenge. And we can see the same thing, uh, challenges pop up on the horizon in the semiconductor world. So if you think about how we do computing today and how the amount of data that we consume is going to explode in the next couple of years, that means by 2030, if we keep doing the things we do today, 20% of our global energy consumption is just going to be around computing, managing that data and consuming. And th that's just not sustainable. So something quite dramatic needs to change there. So those are the kind of challenges that people in the Innovation Hub are working on. And for example, neuromorphic computing could be one way into that uh, area. So if you think about how the brain works, the brain only uses 20 watts of power. And if you would have a similar computing power in a supercomputer, you need 150 megawatts. So there is this field that you can see appear on the horizon where you say, okay, that is something where we can do something. We don't have the full solution. 
uh, as intermolecular or at, as Merck KGA Darmstadt Germany. But we would like to, you know, collaborate and bring our part to the table. And that's what this, this team is doing. And that's why I'm so excited to uh, now have that team together with intermolecular so that we can start establishing these partnerships and start working with them. So, Casper, you guys work with large semiconductor companies and startups alike, right? How can startups utilize this innovation hub? Yeah, so we work with startups in very much the same way as we work with large companies. So, so startups, when they come to us, usually they are at the stage that they are just about to leave their university lab or whatever lab they are in. They have an initial idea. They have some initial funding. And then they need to really quickly ramp up to get to the next stage of their development, which is often a working prototype. So what we help the startups with is we use our tools and, and combinations to make that possible. Uh, so what we help them with is finding the material combination that allow that innovation that they have in mind and really build that first prototype for them. So our tools lend themselves very well and our flexible processes for this process. They are actually out of our clean rooms again really quickly and then onto a mass production a foundry, for example, that can produce these. But at this early stage, our flexible processes really help them to quickly map out these things where the companies struggle to actually take that to a foundry because in a mass manufacturing environment, uh, there's not much flexibility that you can have. So it's the flexible tools, uh, the flexible process flows, but also the experience in the teams that we have doing that in a low risk. So you want to change as little as possible while keeping your innovation uh, ideas alive, because if the, the, the fewer complexity you have, more chance of success you have. On the other hand, you want to keep the core of your startup idea alive. So that's really where we support them to show that. That's great. Now, Casper, when I was researching this topic, I found it really interesting how you were drawn to semiconductors personally. Can you tell my audience a bit about this journey? Yeah, so I mean, I've been always really fascinated by control at the atomic limit, right? So if you think about atoms as different Lego blocks, but then you start building with the different atoms, your systems, and then you get these fascinating effects by making these combinations. So I started out a long time ago um, during my studies working on a lithography tool uh, that they use now for, for making semiconductors. And if you see with any next generation of these tools where the products, the semiconductor chips get smaller, the tools get bigger and they use more power and they blast more energy to make even smaller chips, right? So while I like the atomic control, that process doesn't fit my engineer's heart, right? So I've been very much fascinated by bottom-up assembly, controlling, having molecules that control themselves and put themselves into a order uh, so that you get the right effect. So I made a little detour into liquid crystals, which are molecules that actually order themselves if you put them... And I've used that in a project on switchable glass, switchable windows for buildings, where we could, by orienting the molecules in a certain way, control how much light and warmth comes into a building. So I built that out into a production company, which now is also part of Merck KGA Darmstadt, Germany. And there are whole buildings with that glass and with a flick of a button, these molecules reorient themselves and then the sun shading comes on for that building. So, you know, that is fantastic. So... Now I'm back into semiconductors and we're using this, this molecular control again to build computer chips. So one of the topics we're working on is uh, directed self-assembly, where you use this self-organization of uh, molecules to support your lithography so that you don't need this huge tool, but you use the patterning of the molecules that they intrinsically have to get your computer chips built. But we are, for example, also using, you know, if you do the right molecules and the right process combination, you can have built, for example, inherently ferroelectric films where you can skip some process steps to directly get the ferroelectric effect that you want. So really having that molecular control and knowing the molecules to find then the optimal process to build the devices that you want, that is really what's the challenge. And we're now seeing the first glimpses of that coming into high volume manufacturing. And that's really what excites me. 
That's really cool. All right, Casper, it is time for your off the cuff question. Now, if you could have one food in the world right now, it doesn't matter if it's in another country, you need a passport to get there, the restaurant is closed. Is there something you'd love to have? Um, yeah, it's a great question. So uh, maybe my accent already gave it away, but uh, I got Dutch roots. And what I would really love to have right now and what's been missing throughout COVID is the bitter balls. So these are deep fried, some sort of meatballs. And usually you enjoy those with a beer and some friends. And due to COVID, clearly uh, we haven't been out uh, having beers with friends nor enjoying any bitter balls. So that means something to, uh, I'd love to have right now. That sounds wonderful. All right, Casper, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. You're very much welcome. Thanks for having me, Emilia. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you want to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash slash EE journal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of super fun techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by yours truly. And you can subscribe to our EE journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you want any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's Fish Frying page. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or, heck, you just want to chat, I promise I will respond. Shoot me a line at amelia at eejournal.com or post a comment on our forums on eejournal. For the week of March 26th, 2021, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.